The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly divided, the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, President of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We do trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we look again into the pages of the Word of God to allow the Spirit of God to teach us through His Word. We've been looking, and we're going to look again today, at the book of Ephesians, the very first, very first verse, just, just a verse that usually people just slide right over. And yet it's exciting to me to see how, how when you really appreciate what a verse like this says, the whole book of Ephesians is right here in this one verse. Ephesians starts with, with, with a bang. It is, as I've said to you before, a prison epistle. Paul, chapter 3, verse 1, uh, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, verse 1, you know, I beseech you there as the, as the prisoner of the Lord Jesus. Um, he's in prison. But yet this is an epistle that starts starts and, and from one end to the other is an epistle of praise where he's rejoicing the verse that I quote to you so often verse 3 blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and then he just goes on to talk about it and about the blessings and the things that God has done and not only that he's done for us but what he's especially Ephesians is about what he's going to do for himself as he brings us into an understanding of all that he's going to accomplish in his son, he's revealed it to us, made it known to us, and uh, we, we can rejoice in it. There are 3,022 words in the book of Ephesians in the King James Bible. If you read at an average pace of about 150 words a minute, you could read this book in 20 minutes. If you just kind of read slow, take your time, you can read it in 30 minutes. Could I challenge you, before we're on next week, read this book. In fact, why don't you just read it tonight or today, whenever you see this program. I know some people see it early in the morning. Some people see it in the evenings. Whenever it's on where you are, do yourself a favor. Now, I'm not going to get anything out of it. You're going to get something out of it. Do yourself a favor and today read the book of Ephesians. If you'll do that for seven days in a row, you won't even, I cannot even describe for you how this little book will allow you to get a grip on it see the flow and thought in it, and then it'll reach in and get a grip on your heart like you never thought was possible. And Paul says, be not conformed to this world. Don't let the form of this world press you. You know, the world wants to form you in its own image. Paul said to the Galatians that I, I travail in birth, my little children, until Christ, again, until Christ be formed in you. What God wants formed in you is His Son. An understanding of His life who he is, what he's doing. And he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by joining the church, tithing, pat no, no, that's what he said. Down south they used to say, I uh, probably still do, to have a successful Christian life you need three ten and out. And so what's that, preacher? Well, three ten and out is you, you attend three services a week, you give 10% of the income, and you pass out tracts. <laughs> Paul didn't say that. He didn't say, be not conformed to this world, will be transformed by three, ten, and out. He didn't say, you're going to enhance your relationship with God and, 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 and uh, uh, make progress in your spiritual life by what you do. He said, be not conformed to this world, will be transformed, listen, by the renewing of your mind. You see, the way you have Christ formed in you is you, you let the Word of God re-educate your thinking process and you learn to think like God thinks. Someone called the book of Ephesians the, Roll Roy the Rolls Royce of Epistles. <laughs> and uh, somebody else called it the Mount Whitney of, of Scripture. And all kind of superlatives have been applied to it. Because you come in Ephesians to a, a high point in the Christian life and who it is we are in Christ and what God's doing. He starts out, Paul, there's our apostle. He knew who he was. That's who I am. I'm Paul. I know I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, an apostle. That's what I do. 
of Jesus Christ. That's how I do it for. By the will of God, that's how it came about that I am who I am. I'm God's spokesman for you. To the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. That's who he's writing to. He knew who the recipients were. He knew they were saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus. They were at Ephesus. We talked about that last time. They were the church of the living God in, con in, in, in contrast to the great temple of Diana, the great religious shrine to the queen of heaven that was at, at Ephesus, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It would be comparable in that day to... In our day, we talk about the Taj Mahal. You know, I know the Taj is not a church. It's a, a sarcophagus for, you know, some dude's uh, love interest, wife that, that, that died, that kind of stuff. But it's still this magnificent, beautiful building that we enshrine. Well, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was this great shrine, the Temple of Diana. And they had this image that fell down from heaven, and they worshiped the Queen of Heaven there. Paul says there's a, there's, a, there's a church of a false, dead religion. And then there's the church of the living God at Ephesus. And the, the Ephesians were that. The saints at Ephesus, the you see, the believers were saints and faithful in Christ Jesus. Three things. One, they're saints. A saint in the Bible is someone who is set apart. Saints in the Bible are not people who've died and have the church canonize them. Okay? That's what, that's what religion does. In the Bible, saints are not dead people, they're living people. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's very important to understand. Religion sometimes uses Bible terminology, puts their definitions on them, and, and then you don't know what to do. A lady called me one time after hearing a radio program. She says, uh, Mr. Jordan, I want one of them dispensations you keep talking about. And I, I, I happened to answer the phone, and she, I said, I, sorry, I'm sorry, ma'am, what do you I want... You keep talking about one them dispensations. I want one of them dispensations you talk about. And it took me a minute to catch on. This lady is involved in a religious system that, that uses the term dispensation as a sort of like a ticket to go out and commit sin with permission. And she should get forgiveness and permission. But if you get a dispensation, you got permission, you got forgiveness and permission before you did it. <laughs> and I, 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 I'm thinking, what... Oh, I know what you are. You're a part of this religion, see? And what, what that religion did is they took a good Bible word, made a religious word out of it. And this lady, every time she heard me teach the verse, read the verse in the Bible, she thought of her religion. That's, that's slick, isn't it? <laughs> that's why I tell you, you have to let the Bible set up its own standard of definitions and terms. Now, you don't have to be like that. You might be uh, like, like somebody who uses uh, the word baptism, a lot in your religion. There are people that use you know that, that word as, as part of the name of their denomination. Well, when they see the word baptism in the Bible, what do they think about? Well, they always think about water baptism because that's the baptism that their denomination is thinking about. And when they talk about water baptism, they mean immersion in water. Put them in, put them, you know, dunk them down and up. But you go to the Bible, and there's a lot of baptisms in the Bible have nothing to do with water. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he talks about the, the nation Israel's baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. When they went across the Red Sea, they were baptized into Moses, and the people that got wet were, were destroyed, and the people that went across on dry land didn't get any water on them. That's a dry baptism, first baptism in the Bible. So a lot of baptisms, you can be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire, no water involved in them. So, you see, denominational definitions you have to be careful about, and, and, and you have to let the Bible set up its own standards. So don't read the Bible out of, out of, out of, a, uh, out of your denominational glasses and denominational dictionary. Read the Bible out of the Bible dictionary. And when you see, read about a saint in the Bible, you're not reading about some dead person that a religion has canonized. You're reading about living people who've trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior and as a result have been set apart out of Adam, into Christ. They've been given a new position and a new identity. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Paul's writing, Unto the church of God which is at, the, at, at, at Corinth, to them that are sanctified, you see that word, sanctified? Sanctified in Christ Jesus, call to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of 
Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. You see, saints are people who've called upon the name of the Lord. They've trusted Jesus Christ alone. And when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you rely exclusively upon what He did at Calvary for you, when He died to pay for everything that's wrong with you, when He was buried to take away your sins and was raised to give you His life, and you understand and trust the finality of, his, of the cross work to put away sin and the reality of His life to give you new life, make you a new creature, when you trust Jesus Christ to be the Savior that He died and rose again for you to be, God does some wonderful things to you. One of them is He takes you out of your old identity and puts you into a new identity. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Look over at chapter, look down at chapter 1, verse 30. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. But of Him are ye in, in Christ Jesus. God the Father has put you into Christ Jesus. Now how did He put you into Christ? 1 Corinthians, we're there in that book, chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into the body of Christ. So you've had your identity changed from being in Adam to now you are in the body of Christ. You are in Christ. How'd you get there? Well, a preacher didn't do it and a priest didn't do it. God the Holy Spirit did it. The moment you trust Jesus Christ, He baptizes you by one spirit are we all baptized into the one body. And by the way, when Paul says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, which one you reckon that would be? Well, the minute you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God doesn't ask your permission. He doesn't tell you you need to go get somebody to do this for you. He, without you knowing it, sensing it, or feeling it, you wouldn't be aware of it except you read it in the Scripture. God, the Holy Spirit, the moment you trust Jesus Christ, baptizes you into the body of Christ. You're, buried, you're crucified with Him. You're buried with Him by baptism into death, not water. And you're raised with Him. So you are identified in His death, His burial, His resurrection. And Ephesians says we're, all, we're even seated together with Him in His session in the heavens. Everything belongs to Him now, belongs to you. And everything belongs to you, by the way, belongs to Him. Because you're in Him. And He's in you. So... Who of God, who of the Father, is made unto us. Here's what God does. He makes Christ our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So where do you get sanctification? Where do you, the idea is to be set apart for the purpose for which you were created. We're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. That's sanctification. Where do you get that? Not in what you figure out how to do, but in who God made you in His Son. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse number 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? For, but be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor adult drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But, now here's the good news, <laughs> uh, verse 11, and such were some of you. That's who you used to be. But that's past tense. Your past is over, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. You've been washed. There's the washing of water by the Word. That's not a water ceremony of a physical nature. You ever sing that song, Are You Washed in the Blood? Somebody says, well, how do you get washed in the blood, you know? Get in the bathtub, go rub it up, up. I mean, don't be silly. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed 2,000 years ago. You couldn't get in the bathtub where you live. How do you get washed in the blood? Romans, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 says he, that uh, unto him who hath loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. How do they get washed from their sins? By faith. By faith. God takes the blood of Jesus Christ and applies it by faith. He said to Israel, he said, though your sins be as scarlet, yet they shall be as white as snow. Though they bleed blood red guiltiness in your sin, yet I'll cleanse you completely so there's not one spot and stain left. 
That's complete, total forgiveness in Jesus Christ. You're sanctified. He doesn't just forgive you, but he sets you apart into this new identity in Jesus. See, a saint is someone who's been radically changed in their identity before God. Hebrews chapter number 10, there, there's a verse here you, you never want to forget when you think about being a saint. Hebrews 10, verse number 10, he says, By the which will, that is by the will of God, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus Christ only died once because he only had to die once because his one payment was sufficient. He didn't have to do it over and over and over again. One time was enough. And you're sanctified by the, uh, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14, For by one offering hath he perfected forever them that are sanctified. That is the identity God gives you in Christ. You need to get off the treadmill, friend. You need to quit trying to, to you need to quit trying to think that you're going to make your 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 relationship with God better. You can make your acceptance by God better by your performance. Nothing is ever going to be as good or better than what Jesus Christ did for you. You need to rest in the identity God gives you in his son. So he writes to the Ephesians and he says, to the saints and to the faithful. And when he added that term faithful, he's talking, someone who's faithful is somebody that's reliable. Okay, it's not brain surgery, you're just reliable. They're fully engaged in, their, in who they are. They're fully functioning saints. They're people who, they're saints who've taken this new identity that they have in Christ and brought it into their experience. And that's why that little word and is important. See, he didn't say faithful saints. He said the saints and faithful. There are two issues here. One is the issue of your identity. There you are. And the other is the issue of growing and bringing that identity into the experience of your life. Come with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. This is the issue of growth. It's the issue of progress. The issue of maturity. If you're blessed with all spiritual blessings and you're complete in Christ, what, what, what else is there? Well, there's nothing else for you to gain. There's nothing else for God to give you that you don't have. There's nothing else for you to strive to attain. But it's like Paul said in Philippians 3, I want to apprehend that for which I was apprehended. He says in Ephesians 1 that he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 says, where we labor, whether present or absent, we might be accepted. What's that talking about? I thought we already are. Paul said, I have this identity in Christ as being completely acceptable to God in the merits of his son. And I live in my life day by day, the work that I'm doing here, the walk that I'm doing here, I live there just to bring that identity into my experience. You see, you live out of your consciousness of your identity. You live out of who you think you are. If you think you're a chopped liver, well, you're going to walk around thinking you're chopped liver and living like you think you're chopped liver. If you think you're the cat's meow, you know, well, then you're going to walk around. You see the kids see somebody stuck up. They say, oh, they're just too big for the britches. They're stuck up. They think too much of themselves. They, they think above themselves, about themselves above what they ought. You live out of a consciousness of your identity. And God says, Christ is your life. Live out of a consciousness of what that means. Well, that's what being faithful is bringing that identity into the experience of your life. Now, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I, I, I want you to see, but I need to get the board out just for a minute so I can kind of kind of illustrate it a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, 
For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. Notice that there is a, there is a progressive issue here. First, there, there's the issue of milk. I fed you with milk and not with meat. Not because I don't want to give you meat, but right now you're not able to bear the meat. You can't take it. It'll choke you, give you indigestion. You can't do it. So I'm, I'm feeding you with milk, the simple things, because you aren't yet able to bear the more advanced things. Now, if you'd come with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 5, Hebrews chapter 5, there is a very poignant passage that identifies in no uncertain terms what these terms are talking about. Hebrews 5, talking to Israel about a very similar issue in their program. Hebrews 5.11, of whom, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. I got some things to tell you, but you're not able to bear them right now. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the, what, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So here's some people that need milk and are not able to eat the strong meat, just like the Corinthians. Now watch verse 13, because here's a definition. For everyone that uses milk is what? Unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he's a baby. Who drinks milk? Babies. Who eats milk? Who eats meat? Adults. You see the growth? Milk, meat, baby, to adults. What is a baby Christian? What is a baby believer? Not somebody who's only been saved three or four months. The verse, verse number 12 says, who by reason, who for the time element here, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you ought to be over there able to teach others, yet you need, you're still back over here as newborn babes desiring the sincere milk of the word. Why? Unskilled in the word of righteousness. If you don't know how to handle God's word, if you don't know how to study, that's why we, I keep preaching to you week after week, you have to learn for yourself to understand God's Word. Don't depend on the preacher. Don't depend on the, the college or the seminary, the books or the commentaries. You need to learn for yourself. You can know for yourself how to study, understand God's Word. Listen, the reason it's boring to you is you don't understand it. If you ever got a glimpse of how to understand God's Word, it would, it would be so exciting to you, you couldn't put it down. You go to church, you get bored, you think these people are nuts for studying that book. It's because you don't grasp it, it hasn't gripped you. That's what dispensational Bible study is all about. That's the change it'll make in your life. Because it helps you to grow from being a baby, unskilled in the word of righteousness, to verse 14. But strong meat belonging to them who are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Here's some people who've come to the place that understand God's Word and are able to apply God's Word, apply the sound doctrine of God's Word to the details of their life. They're not over in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or the book of Jeremiah, or the book of Genesis, trying to find information about them. They know that's Israel. They know where their doctrine is. They know to go to Paul's epistles, Romans to Philemon, and they know how to go in there, find the truth of God, and how to take that truth, not just know it in their head, but to take it and apply it to the details of their life. And being an adult that eats strong meat, is someone who by reason of use has their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. They know how to take the doctrine and bring it in the experience of their life and to have it be their life. Now go back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Because there's a specific set of information Paul's talking about here. 1 Corinthians 2 verse number 1. 
And I was with, and I, brethren, when I was uh, came to you, came not with excellence of speech, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Over here, the milk that he gave the Corinthians, he calls it, because they're babes, is just simply the issue about the cross work. That's what the book of Romans is all about. Understanding what God has done for us at the cross. Understanding God's grace. He says the first thing you have to be is oriented to the grace of God provided for you in the cross work of Christ. But look at verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, you know, not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world in our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of, uh, of glory. That's the advanced information uh, about, the, the, about the mystery, about the church, the body of Christ. That's the information about the goal that God has. Why does he say, what's he doing today? He's forming the church of the body of Christ or something he's going to do in the ages to come. And that's what the book of Ephesians is about. The babes to the adults. That's why he talks to the faithful. Now, by the way, in here, between it, is something Paul calls carnal. You know what keeps you from growing from the babe to the adult? Getting focused on yourself, getting focused on other people like you, depending on your resources and just being carnal, being self-focused. That's why I keep pounding the issue with you. It isn't you, it's Christ. And you get focused on who God has made you in Christ, and you, you understand His grace, and then you'll understand what He's doing with you. You move from Romans to Ephesians, you know what you do? You grow up. You want to be faithful? That's how you get to be faithful. You want Christ formed in you, that's how you get Christ formed in you. Not a denomination, not your ideas, but God's mind in yours. I'm sorry, we got to go. Till next time, Maranatha.